Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. We have the World Championship coming up in a couple of days. We have US elections. We have Italian referenda. We have French elections, all kinds of things going on. The main idea of this show is to provide players with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. You can send these questions in advance and the best way to do that is ask is to send an email to askiamwatson at chessclub.com. That's A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com, C-H-E-S-S-C-L-U-B dot C-O-M. Uh, the other way to do it is to ask on the screen right now. That's one, uh, one other way to do it is ask on the screen right now. I see we've already got Alan there, and I'm sure other people will be coming on soon. You simply go to your chat. If, if you don't see the chat, you have to sign into Google. Most people are already signed in there. And just simply ask a question or talk with each other or just make some random comments about chess. Everything is appreciated. This is a total free-for-all, and you should enjoy that. So, and then the other way to contact me is through ICC itself. If you're an ICC member, you can message me. That, so you, you write the word message, M-E-S-S-A-G-E, -S -S space, John L. Watson, L as in lion, J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N, and send me a message there. Obviously, email is the best because you get a chance to really think about what you're saying. You can send a game. You can send questions, include things like almost anything about chess. Uh, openings are asked about a lot. You can ask about books. You can ask about videos. You can send a game. You can ask about how to improve. You can ask about world events. Anything that occurs to you, we've talked about pretty much all of it on this show. So um, we have something from Alan here. And uh, he is reporting a game. Well, since a lot of people aren't even on yet, we'll wait with that for a second. And I'll start with what I was going to talk about anyway, and then we'll get back to the chat. Uh, first of all, in last week's chat, uh, Philo 28 full <laughs> put in the moves to Milman Fang, and he called it, quote, the best game of the 21st century, unquote. And indeed, it has a beautiful finish, so I looked it up, and here it is. He put in the moves, but I wasn't able to copy and paste them all. So maybe you'll want to see that. Some of you probably already checked it out. Um, it's a Caro can. This is the main line. Let me turn down my sound here. A little feedback I'm getting here for some reason. Okay. Um, it's a main line Caro can. White chases the bishop. Uh, those of you who know the Caro can know that this is all standard stuff. Knight d7 stops knight e5, which would have harassed the bishop, although sometimes black allows that. And white challenges the bishops. They come off. This has been played thousands and thousands of times. That move allows. Okay, now this is uh, this is one of the more modern approaches with bishop b4 check. Uh, there are many other moves. I won't even go into that. But um, queen a5 check is the, is kind of one of the old moves. And a lot of times people are castling kingside now. Maybe ever since Jovanka Huska's book on the Karo Can, that's become extremely popular. It used to be that you all people always castled queenside, and now they're sort of castling kingside. And uh, and have been now for almost 10 years. So it's not like this is just recent, but but it's recent from the standpoint of an old guy like me. Okay, so white tucks away the king. Usually when you castle queen side, it's a good idea to throw in that move in almost any opening, unless you have a, unless it lo loses too much time, and here it doesn't. So white advances. Now, I guess I do have some notes on this. Not serious ones, really. Knight e5 uh, isn't the only move, of course. I think a good idea for black now. Black plays c5. I'm not so sure about that move. It's not terrible. It attacks the center. Um, one thing possible to do here is gain space on the queen side. I think a5 was a good move. Uh, one of the structures that black likes, of course, he can't get it immediately, but one of the structures black sometimes likes is to get b5 in and then put a knight on c4 and a knight on d5, sort of pseudo outposts. Both of them are theoretically attackable, but if you have pawns on these squares, a4 and b5, it's hard to attack knights on those squares. Uh, the basic overall theme in this position, by the way, is the one we're so used to with opposite side castling, which is white would like to go g4, g5. An attack on the king side, and black would like to go b5, b4, a5, a4, etc., etc., and attack on the queen's side. And there have been many, many games played with this, although I think knight e5 is not the most common move. But I'm not going to annotate this game. That wasn't really the idea. I'll just give you a few general ideas of what's going on. The main point is just to show the position that Thilo, full, Thilo 28 full originally put on the board, which we're coming up to in a second. These are probably not brilliant moves. And in fact, allowing 
allowing white to get this far is probably a very bad sign. Because now, this is a beautiful knight here. Also, I don't think he should have taken there. This knight is incredibly strong. Knight's on f5, we talked about it. I call that the Kasparov knight. Also, this is a really nice pawn structure because the black bishop is cut off and that piece that's going to be on d5, in this case a rook, is hard to get rid of. Plus, there's tactical problems, as you'll see. Okay, so black slithers out of the way. White captures that pawn, and that's just such a strong rook, and now he can double on the file. This is very close to lost, I think, but not necessarily. And now white plays a very nice little move, a little sacrificial move. It turns out it's probably not the best move. Uh, it'd be better to just say, I've got much the better game here. I'm going to just get my pieces rolling, or maybe double. Uh, but this is still a good move, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so black plays um, attacks, counterattacks on the queen. The queen comes up to e4, good move. Black goes back again, and um, that's actually a huge mistake. He probably should just uh, admit that he's a pawn down for the moment and try to get a counterattack by attacking in the center. You know, the queen sort of aims this way. Black has some compensation for this pawn. White's better, but at least it's a way to play. This turns out to be a blunder, and you'll see why. Now, first of all, white misses the um, the win and gives black another chance here. Black could play a number of moves here, but in particular, he could go back to playing this rook f d a move now. So white repeats, and black repeats, thinking, oh, I've got a draw, I guess, but white finds the right move this time. And that is simply a completely winning move. Um, very clever, giving up the rook. And you might want to stop it and see if you see the end from this point on. Um, stop the tape, especially if you're watching on YouTube after the show is all, not live anymore. Um, and, and see if you can see how this combination goes. And it's quite pretty. Uh, it goes like this first, now threatening all kinds of checkmates with bishop takes. And black checks. Black plays there, which I guess he thought was going to try and save him by sort of throwing a knight into that square. But white checks that way. Very nice. Now if bishop takes, of course, we have bishop here check, or bishop f6 check, whatever. Mating quickly. Probably bishop takes e5, I guess. And um, so black moves there, thinking, hey, I've gotten away with things. I'm sort of getting out of this a little bit. But white has a win. You can stop the tape here, even. A win. He plays this. And this is the very pretty move that... Uh, was put up last week, and this is the solution. No matter what takes, the same thing happens. And just for example, in the game, this happened. No matter what takes the queen, though, you get the exact same position. You get that position, whether the whether the queen had taken it or whether the knight had taken it. So a very pretty little mate. Okay, I'm not going to go any further than that because it's not a game we need to really analyze in depth or anything. Uh, I had another question. Let me let me uh, look at the chat briefly here. First, since that's what we like to do. Ooh, we're getting a lot of stuff here. Okay, the first thing we got is from Alan. Let me put a board up. Um, okay, uh, Alan says he got, this is an Elyekin defense, which turns into a Peart's defense. Um, White plays this very popular move, bishop e3, arguably the most popular move these days. White plays this, uh, so it's not quite a Grand Prix attack, but it's similar to one. Knight e3, queen d2, c5, black's counterattacking in the center, white defends it, so now we have this basic, very dragon like uh, position. Actually, it is like a dragon, uh, except that the knight's on a6, which is probably not a good sign. So he says that c5 is a mistake. I'm, I'm not positive c5 is a mistake, but I think the combination of knight a6 and c5 and taking on d4 is for sure a mistake. So, so there we go. You said it wasn't possible to get a dragon from a pyramid. Well, not by force. <laughs> I, can, I can arrange anything you want. Uh, you can, everything's possible, but uh, this would be, these are moves that are extremely unusual by black. Uh, and uh, yeah, c5 may be a mistake, um, but I'm not totally convinced. I'd have to take a look at that. Knight a6 is not a very good move in that particular position, I don't think. Not against f3. Knight a6 is a pretty standard Peart's move, but not with f3, and I don't think it makes much sense. I don't like this move at all. And having played knight f6, I guess I would probably aim for some sort of c6, castle, z5 idea instead of c5. So I think you're right that c5 is probably not very good. But um, anyway, okay, so that was uh, interesting. What else do we have here? 
we have talk about chess books. No, we can't. Can't be, you have to talk about a particular chess book. I can't. I can't just talk about chess books in general. So if we start mentioning certain books, that'll be great. And we've done that before a little bit. I'd love to talk more about chess books. It's a lot of fun. What is the best opening for beginners playing D4 against D4? And Anthony says D5. It's certainly possible. Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, he says it's boring. Um, hi, John. Okay. No opening is boring unless you play it in a boring man manner. Queen's Gambit declined is. I'd say that a lot of it depends on your level and your intent. If you don't want to have, if you don't want to be bored, if you think if you think D4, D5 is inherently boring, I would think about playing it dynamically. You know, maybe C5 systems. Just for example, if he plays the Queen's Gambit, um, well, the Slav is not necessarily boring. You do have to deal with the exchange Slav, but it can be very exciting. But also, even if you're playing a Queen's Gambit decline, you know, there are things like the Tarash. This is perfectly playable. In fact, we're going to talk about this today a little bit if we get to it. Um, it's an interesting and dynamic opening you could play. It sort of depends on your level. After all, you're not playing the World Championship where you have to sort of neutralize everything in the opening. Um, so, so, no, there are plenty of dynamic ways to play. You can even go crazy, or you can play things like the Alvin Counter Gambit if you want to. Or the Hennig Shara Gambit. Um, there's all kinds of ways to to jazz up, um, to jazz up the Queen's Gambit. The Jagoran defense is a lot of fun. I have a whole series about the Jagoran defense and how to play it. I still think it's a, a playable opening. It's a lot of fun and it tends to be very dynamic. So yeah, you could play d5 for sure. Um, you're a d4 player, so maybe in some ways you could also think about playing what you don't like to play against. Think about your games. Think about what you've lost against, and think about playing that. That's one way to, to look at it. So, um, so that maybe that's just a start. It's too general a question in a way because I've only got the first move from you. But, but we can talk about it in more detail. You can also send me an email and ask me more specifically. You mean the symmetrical English isn't boring? Well, it doesn't have to be. The symmetrical English can be pretty exciting sometimes. I played I played white in the English for years, and I got a lot of exciting games. So, yeah, you can definitely get you can get fun games out of the symmetrical English. Or the Berlin Wall. Well, the Berlin Wall, I, I suppose. I, you know, that's. You, <laughs> I have no idea. I guess at a at a grandmaster level, I think boring is is maybe, maybe possible to say because they they know so well how to play that two bishop ending. So maybe maybe the Berlin Wall. But of course, on your level, you can avoid the Berlin Wall easily by just playing uh, Knight D3. And in fact, that's what they're doing now for the most part. Most of the top players are playing that now. So just about everyone in the top ten plays that most of the time. So. Nothing's really boring. I agree that nothing's really boring if you treat it your own way. You can pretty much always avoid completely boring chess. Okay. Um, B takes A6. Well, I don't know which line that was. Oh, bishop takes A6 in that Pierce. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. that. That gives up the two bishops. I'm a little unclear. Yeah, I know. I see what you're, you're saying that. Yeah, but you wouldn't play C takes D4. Is that worth going over? Uh, maybe real quick, and then we'll get back to stuff that we were sent beforehand. Okay, so last chat question for the moment. Uh, this wasn't the order, was it? But we got to this position. So, um, yeah, so it was like this, and pretty soon knight a6 and c5 was played. I'm trying to remember what the order was. Was castles in? No, I think castles wasn't in. Uh, it was knight a6, queen d2. Was it c5 now? And you're saying bishop takes, but in fact what you would do is you would gambit this pawn. And black might have pretty decent play here because um, he's got good development, he's got the b file, and he has the bishop pair. And both bishops are pretty good. So I wouldn't really probably play it this way as white. I might, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't count on this being a big advantage anyway. It might be an advantage, but it's not, not really easy to play. I'd much rather that black had already castled, and I don't believe he had. So maybe in this particular position, bishop a6 works pretty well. As was pointed out, you can't play C takes D because of check. That would be just winning a piece. So that would be awful. But uh, you know, just having the two bishops here, you never, you never know what you can do with them. Uh, the computer, of course, will like white. <laughs> but um, but you know, you can have some fun in these positions as black, even though arguably white's better objectively. The fact that black hasn't castled really does not help black at all. Okay, good, good, good question there. Let me um, show you. Okay, so we got a question about 1b3, and we can talk about that. Uh, but let me first do something else from last week also. I, oh, I was looking at last week's chat just this morning, <clears throat> and I saw, let me put this game up, and I saw that um, someone had asked about the Halloween Gambit. 
And I just saw online, so I mean, there's all these arguments online about the Halloween Gambit, so I thought I'd take a quick look at it again. I always thought it was unsound. Uh, let me show you what that is. This again actually was the same, but this was also Thylo 28 full, I think. So he asked fun questions. We're getting fun stuff from him. And I think we talked about this really briefly before, but it's the, it's the Four Knights game, and then it's this amazing move, giving up a piece. And um, then playing here, and then just jamming all your pawns forward is the idea. Just rolling them all forward and trying to bowl black over. And so I, uh, I have this, what I did is I looked up the correspondence games. Because I've looked at this with people over the years once in a while, but I don't remember any of it. And I just remember thinking it's probably on sound, but I, so I decided I'll look in correspondence because if they play it there, someone's going to refute it if it's refutable, probably. And indeed, it scores absolutely horribly in correspondence, so that's not a good sign. Uh, for white to have a bad game after move five or something is kind of bad. So now a lot of the analysis online has to do with that move. I don't really like that move. I think it's true that black might still be okay. For one thing, he can he can just play very safely by giving the piece back and then playing here. And if white plays here, you can play here. And then you've got discovered attacks all over the place uh, that you can do. And after the, uh, let me see, something like this, check here. I think I think this move is quite strong, check. See, that's a check. And then just move the rook over, and you're on this guy. And it's you're only maybe very slightly better as black, but you're already better. So that's not a good sign. There's a bailout, in other words, for black. But I think if black's bold and brave, he can just stay a piece ahead. Now, one of the main lines goes like this. And um, attacks. And now, look, he has to go back to G8. That's a good sign. Although I suppose this is a very safe line also, by the way. One problem with this line is if black wants to be a spoil sport, you know, you can you can do something like this, and that's quite safe for black. Might even be a tiny bit better for black, although I wouldn't swear by that. So unfortunately, you can always ruin these gambits. But but um, the most important thing is um, trying to refute it. And in this case, white plays this cute move. And the main answer in the books is to play here. And then if that happens, I think black does well by taking here and just giving up the rook in the corner. But black can also play, uh, white can play this move, as is pointed out all over the place online, and at least he gets some play. I suspect black's fine here too, but at least it's, it's inter it gets very interesting. It gets like fun. Um, so, but what I think, just to sort of avoid all this, uh, is why let white's pawns advance so much? Why not just play this move? And white has to attack this now, or else he's just a piece down for nothing, and then come back. And now white has to do something. Now it's too slow. The pawns are too slow by themselves. Black just plays d5 or something, and it's just that's not going to work. So, um, so white plays this move to stop d5, and also aim that aim at that square, get castled quickly, and roll up roll up black's position. And my problem with this position is, uh, and this is what I remember from the old days too, is I never could figure out what to do against that. It gives white a second pawn. He pretty much has to take it. But then black's able to blockade the light squares a piece up. And when you're when you've given up two pawns for a piece, and you still have the middle game in front of you, it tends to be very good for the side that has the extra piece. This is just a real problem. It's, it hasn't been played very much, but it was actually played, I think, in this game. Was it played in this game? Yeah, it was actually played in this game. And uh, this is a game between 2350 players in correspondence. And I think correspondence ratings, that's pretty good. It tends to, correspondence ratings tend to be a little lower on average from what I can tell. And uh, I'll show you how the game went. The game went like that, attacking e6. He defended it, and white resigned. <laughs> and that's how bad this line is, because, oh, sure, you've got two pawns for a piece, but black's ahead in development. Black's attacking this square. Black can gain time all over the place. Black has a beautiful outpost. Black has a better bishop. <laughs> so, I mean, here you are, your piece ahead, basically. And um, that's a very sad uh, result of the opening. And that's scary because after this move, which is pretty much forced, this position strikes me as pretty much forced. I mean, I looked at some alternatives, but there don't seem to be any. You know, white has two pawns for a piece, but black's already blockaded the position, and he's just going to bring his pieces out really fast. So I'm, I'm rather upset by this position. Whether you take it or not isn't that important. Whether you take this, this or not isn't very important because black can always put a piece in here or maybe on f5. or It's... Um, it's a scary position. I mean, for example, if you castled, I think we just go here. And if you tried f4, let's say, because you got to do something aggressive, then just something like this, blockading. <clears throat> and attacking d4, by the way. And that's just, it's no fun. So I, I think the ball 
it's funny that the, again, that this opening survives. So maybe I'm just missing something. There's a there's a contingent online that's constantly defending every line and saying it's okay, but they they didn't mention what to do against this line, which is the one that's always bothered me the most. And uh, but you'll see all kinds of things online about about this trying to defend this position for um, for white the Helen Gambit. And uh, I hate to hurt anything, but if you are black, this is <laughs> this is probably a good way to proceed. And, and uh, in any case, I'll, I'm perfectly happy to accept more input about this, but I'm, I just I don't see this sacrifice really working very well. Okay, so then we have a much older question that I never got to, so maybe I'll go back to the chat for a second, because that'll take a little while. What's your opinion about 1b3, the Nimzo Larson attack? b3 is dangerous for black, the bishop on b2 can be strong. Okay, so I think it's Yobava that's been playing this a whole bunch um, recently. Um, and of course the related line is the Nimzovich larsen attack which starts with this. And then you're going to play b3 against most moves, either this, b3, or maybe c5, b3, maybe even knight f6, b3. But uh, this, the Nimzovich, it's called the Nimzovich larsen attack. More top players have played it this way than the other way. And I think that's just because most people think e5 is a sufficient answer. Perfectly logical opening, perfectly fine. As I said last week, if you can play b6, we had the same question last week whether b3 was playable. If you can play b6 against almost anything, you know, there's a whole book about e4, b6. If you can even think about playing it as a first move, you can certainly play b3 as a first move. So it's sound. It's there. There, you've created no weaknesses. You're getting a piece out. The question is, the reason more people don't play it is because it's pretty much everything equalizes against it. That's the problem. Pretty much everything, if black knows what he's doing, or even doesn't, if he just plays common sense moves, he's going to have a pretty equal game. And that's why it's not a more popular move. I think there's a misconception among lower players that if white isn't worse, somehow it's some, he's played a good opening. And uh, the idea of most openings is to get an advantage, or at least get a position that puts pressure on the opponent, makes it hard, makes him play well to equalize. So all, pretty much all openings for white, if black plays well, are going to eventually be drawn with a perfect game. If you had some supercomputer that, uh, I mean really supercomputer, the size of the universe, you, you, you'd end up with draws. But the idea in the opening is to try and put pressure on the opponent. And the problem with b3 is it's a little slow. There's just many, many good answers to it, or many good ways to play. You can even set up with the King's Indian sort of thing, because this move bishop takes f6 is really not very good. In fact, most good players won't play that. They'll play something else at that point. This this two bishops comes out just fine for black, and uh, that's a problem because one of the things b3 is trying to stop is a king's Indian-ish thing. e5 is fine. I used to play this way with d6. Um, even the main lines are fine. Where you know, for example, one of the main lines that people really love to look at is uh, this one. When you take and take. And black often one of the modern answers to that is this, and it's holding up very well. White white plays all sorts of exotic things. I won't go into any detail here, but it's um, it's a fun line to look at. Um, let me see what else. Um, black can play f6 ideas. Those are I think considered okay against f6. A lot of times white wants to play sort of a gambity kind of thing and just sort of smash his way through. Play bishop c4 and just maybe even just give a, give away a pawn at some point and try and blast through. That's kind of fun for white, so most, most players black won't do that. Obviously d5's got to be fine, there can't possibly be anything wrong with it. What you'd like as white is for black to play the move c5, even though it's still probably equal. You, you want black to, to go into some c5 system so that you can play reversed, reversed Queens Indians and Nimzu Indians and Benonis and things like that. This is, this is kind of what you're aiming for. A lot of the famous games have gone like this, for example and black just sort of gets his piece out. A lot of times white will play that move. You look at all the classic famous lines, even this is considered equal, but I think I'd rather be white here. It's a lot easier for white to play. And then what white does is sets up one of these classic attacks on the king, or maybe even g4, g5. Usually more like d6, knight d7, knight e5, and swing, some, swing a rook up to f3, or a queen out to f3, and try and checkmate black on the king's side. That's kind of what you're, that, that, that's, that's what inspires white to play b3, is that kind of position or one of the things that inspires it. Okay, superficial answer, but the answer is yes, of course you can play b3, there's no problem, but it's fairly easy to equalize against. Okay, here's something, I found a sacrifice, a gambit in the Sicilian by mistake. <laughs> it's a bad sign. If it's by mistake, that's probably a bad sign. But you never know, okay, here we go. 
d6, uh, d4, c, d, knight takes d. So go ahead, folks, just throw anything on there. You can also throw in your opinions of what we're looking at. Uh, knight f6, b3 with that idea. See, that's a center pawn. You just don't want to give up a center pawn. I can tell you already, this is a very poor idea. Yeah, see, it's true, you've got some pieces out in a position like this, but, but black has no weaknesses. So he's a center pawn down. He has got two center pawns to none. That's worth almost a pawn by itself. So it, black's already better positionally. So I can just tell you there's no way. This just isn't, this just isn't any good. But I know that uh, Alan's a skeptic. He, he still insists that his other line that he, that he talked about the other week is OK. And I think it really isn't. But, so we'll just disagree with that. And um, you can play a bunch of, you play a good bunch of games with this, Alan, and see, or maybe you have already, and see, see how you come out. But, but um, you know, I'm not going to go into specifics here, but I would say just about any move. E5, knight, c6, e, uh, e6. All these moves are fine. I probably wouldn't play g6 because you're just asking for bishop h6 and h4, h5 kind of ideas. That would be the one move I wouldn't play. But almost any other move on the board has to be just fine for black. I mean, any other logical developing kind of move. All right, so I'm going to put that one down. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to criticize that one. So you can defend yourself, and um, we'll move on to the next the next thing. Okay, um, let me do that. Let me go to the next thing, because I was asked this a long time ago, and I never got around to it. It says, from your, from your book, A Strategic Chess Opening Repertoire for White, one of the lines you recommend against the Grunfeld, let me put this up here. Um, put this up here. Is, and I'll show you what it is. Against the Grunfeld, I've got two lines I recommend to try and sort of get out of the book, or the main book. Now, it's very easy to get to this position. Black doesn't have that many choices. And it's this move. Now, the other move I recommend playing is this. Um, and I'm not claiming an advantage for either one. I'm just claiming that they're interesting, that they're interesting things to do. So so that's the, let me, let me just show you this for a second. Um, this move, Queen H4 checks, has been played by some very, very strong players, uh, guys like Kramnik and Aronian and, uh, well, various players. And um, the idea is that if you play a normal, uh, oh, let's say one of the old main lines, black has a really simple way of just attacking in the center. And putting his knight on that square really reinforces the attack and can come to this nice square where it attacks um, attacks the light squares, attacks the bishop and attacks the light squares. Now this is of course very controversial and in the end black's doing okay in these positions but it's obviously worth playing for a while. It's obviously worth playing for both sides because people have done so for many many years. The idea of queen a4 check is to kind of discombobulate black, try to use up some squares. For example if, if black plays there he can't put a knight there anymore. So you just go back into normal sort of play but he doesn't have this c5 knight c6 idea, at least not yet. So, uh, and if black puts a knight here, which is arguably one of the best moves, at least he can no longer play that stereotype plan of c5 and knight c6. And if he puts a queen here, you can either take it off or play, uh, for example, here or here, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So the two main moves, it's turned out. So the question is, how is it doing? Um, he looked it up and he said that he thought white was doing pretty well. Uh, it says, I filtered this for players over 2300. White has a good square, 59%, which is very good. What are your thoughts about this? Of course, black can play other moves on move six. That might be, well, I'll talk about that maybe at some other point. And he says, by the way, I like this book a lot. He means, he means my book. It's a repertoire book for white, the strategic chess opening repertoire for white. Um, my answer is that it seems to be doing okay still. It doesn't seem to have a better score. I didn't get 59%, I got more like 53, which is a pretty normal white result. Um, but it still leads to positions with a lot of content. So this is still a legitimate, irregular alternative for white to try against the Grunfeld, and I would recommend it. Most of the players you play against probably haven't even seen it, so that's a good sign. Or if they've seen it, they have never really bothered to study it. Um, the game in front of you is Moisenko Vashir Lagrav, and it was gonna, I was going to illustrate the move Queen D7, which is this, the two moves that are played most often are Queen D7 and Knight D7. So I can't go through all the theory at all, but I thought I'd show you just an example so people get a feel of what white and black are both trying to do. I want to show this from the black point of view, too, because a lot of you are Grunfeld players. The Grunfeld's very popular right now. Um, yeah, Alan says the problem is black plays e5 instead of knight takes e4. He could do that, but he could also just play e5 and then play knight takes e4. So uh, those positions are all fantastic for black. So 
So you've got a lot of convincing to do from my point of view. But but you're welcome to try it and have fun with it. But it, it doesn't to me. He doesn't need to play e5 first. But uh, anyway, you guys can go back and look at that and see what you think. Um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll fight it out if we get into a, a, a debate, which would be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, okay. In this game, he plays the move that's probably the most interesting, which is this move, just retreating. The queen has some nice scope on that square and a threat on that square. One disadvantage of having the queen there is sometimes a knight can come here with tempo, and sometimes a bishop can come here with tempo. So white has to try to find lines where that doesn't happen, or if it happens, it isn't effective. In the meantime, we have a normal position with a queen on b3, with um, where black has the extra move queen d7 in. It's like black has two moves. The point is that the move queen d7, white feels actually hurts him. And I think you could argue that might be true, or at least it's not a very useful move. The queen no longer is on a dark square coming out to a5, for example. It gets in the way of the bishop developing. So you could argue that the queen is not as good on d7 as it is on. That's what, that's what white would like to think anyway. So in this game, black played normal move castles. White can also play knight f3 instead of bishop e3. Might, might be more accurate. Um, b6 and bishop b7. Double fianchetto, a little pressure here. Very standard sort of idea. If you play for c5, there's always the idea that white can play d5 and cramp black. And let me show you a quick example of that between some players whose names you will recognize. And um, did he play queen c7 first? Sorry, no, he didn't. He played e6 first. White simply develops here. There are options. And then black played um, captures queen c7 at some point. Oh, he did play queen c7 first, my fault. But now he played, let's say he just plays it now. I don't think it's going to make any difference. And then bishop f5. Uh, let's see what I've got here. For some reason, I seem to be missing move. c5. Oh, I'm going to go back. I'm sorry about that. Let me uh, go back. This was c5 without b6. So let me just play it right away. My fault. OK, so this was like playing this absolutely straight away. Um, no, I'm sorry, and then d5, which is the usual answer to c5, but not the only one. You can also just hold on to your central position. Okay, this is what happened, sorry. Captured, played here, stops rook b1, and maybe thinks about playing bishop e4. Good, good aggressive developing move, castles, knight d7. So black has all his pieces out. Um, but I think white's a little better in this position. Now there's this problem of d6. So black tries to blockade that. And the idea is that if white takes there, at some point black can take there. Um, but white simply takes it anyway. This is not a bad move either. Knight up to h4. He simply takes that and plays here. By the way, I think this was a blitz game or something. But these players are so good. I'll just tell you right now. This is Hikaru Nakamura versus Maxim Vashir Lagrav. It's a chess.com game. It may have been a very rapid game or a blitz game or something. But at any rate, they're playing pretty good moves. Um, black played here, and white played this nice move. And the problem is that's isolated and that's a pass pawn, and white was just better. Now, that's not a theoretical game, but it shows you what some of the ideas are for both sides. That white's trying to cramp black with that pawn, and black might be trying to just get his pieces out and maybe isolate this pawn and hope it becomes weak. Okay, so in this game, he plays b6 instead, my fault. And white defends the center. By the way, again, instead of this, a very interesting game went with this move, which is kind of slow, but it's very solid. Look at that solid center. And black tried to take off the weak, uh, take off his um, white's best bishop, one on f1. And black, white tried to deter the move c5, but black just played it anyway. And that's a very common idea, that if white takes that, black will just move over to the side somewhere, and he'll have pressure along this file. So black played c5, and white sort of ignored it, and got the rest of his pieces out. And this position, I think, is sort of instructive of what both sides are trying to do, which is black's trying to play on the queen side and use these light squares, like this square, this square, this square, maybe put something on c4 even. The only difference here is that black would really like his knight to be here so that he could move to a5 and come in on c4. So white has one advantage he doesn't usually have in these positions. He has the center, which is normal. And he can start trying to advance the center. But he also has a slightly weak piece. And he tries to take advantage of that by attacking it. And black decides to sacrifice a um, pawn here. 
and white ends up taking it and he ends up getting the better game even though black gets his pawn back um, white ends up getting the better game here so I don't know if this is worth showing because black has what looks like a lot of activity but these pawns are quite strong and white managed to consolidate so black should have just played straight back and really black's position even here isn't that bad black has the same idea of coming up and going here but I prefer white slightly. The center is usually more important than the, the flank pawns in positions like this. On the other hand, Black's not would not be terribly unhappy here. This, he's done his sort of his standard ideas. He'd love to put a knight on a5. He wouldn't mind putting a queen on b5 or c4. Maybe put a pawn here to restrain white's center. White might play d5 right away just to stop knight c6 and maybe deter e6. So that's that's another game. So f3 is a very interesting move, but he didn't play it. Uh, player in this game, Moisenko, versus also Vashir Legrov, by the way, played knight f3 instead. Vashir Legrov counterattacked in the center, and black develops, and white plays a very interesting move here. This should be about equal. It's the usual thing where black has queenside chances, and white has the center, but um, white came up with kind of an interesting idea here. He pins this, threatening to advance, and after black attacks the center he just comes back and now these pawns are a little bit weak they're kind of hard to defend and black can't take that because and let's see if I get this right I think what happens is oh yes he pins this and black can't really defend it because after that there's this capture because of the pin and uh, the queen has to move and then we have we're just gonna win this maybe even take that for example I don't know uh, something like this followed by well it's just winning isn't it because you're on everything so, um, or at least you're much, much better. So he can't take that, but he does have to defend this. And then white played that move in the center. And all of a sudden, black's not coordinating as well as he'd like to. Now, black still doesn't stand that badly. But the idea here, oh, by the way, this is an exchange sacrifice, because he can play that move. And uh, let me just show you how that works. OK, this, black could play this first, because that's kind of a threat. And after white takes that, black would win the exchange. But if you're used to uh, a lot of chess these days, the winning exchange doesn't really mean much in a position like this because black has huge weaknesses and it's very hard to defend this. Uh, this bishop has been attacked. It's very, very weak. These pawns are advanced. There's a move knight e5. There's a move, there's a move like um, queen c3 followed by bishop h6 or even knight e5 g4. There's all kinds of ideas here. And it turns out I think white's simply better in this position even though he's exchanged down. He can also win a pawn back at some point. So you have to look at that. You have to look at this position and see what you think. But I, I don't, Black didn't want to go into that. This is Vashir Legrov, one of the top ranked players in the world. So he kind of knew what he was doing um, and didn't play that. He played the other way. He decided not to take the exchange. He decided to just play safely in the center because he knew this was a prepared line. And um, Black played their good move. White attacks and Black decides to give up a pawn, which is a good move. And it kind of worked this way. We'll just show you how this goes. Okay, you might say, well, white's a clear pawn up, but black has pressure on the queen side. And he has two bishops, a bishop pair, and figures I can hold this because, um, because I've got a little bit of an initiative. Oh, and he plays a kind of clever thing. Now, you don't have to play this at all, but it's a very interesting way to defend. He accepts opposite colored bishops and just smashes away in the center because that pawn is pinned. And uh, so white plays back because he figures if I can preserve this bishop that king's going to be very weak. So white has to play there. Unfortunately white can't just pin this because black will take that pawn and the queen can't be taken because of checkmate. So in a way we're getting a lot of very normal themes here. And white plays here threatening checkmate but black simply blocks him off and white then defends the pawn that's hanging. And I don't know if I need to go into too much more detail here. Um, White ended up winning this game. He is still, he's not a pawn up anymore, but this is quite weak because of the rook d1. Turns out this should be drawn, but uh, because of the opposite colored bishops, but only White has winning chances, and White eventually won. I don't know if it's worth going through too much more because we're getting already fairly late in the show. I just wanted to show you that idea. And, um, and I might even show you one more game with queen a4 unless I've got other questions. So let me at least put it up there and then I'll look at the chat for a second. This would be a fun line to play as white or black in my opinion. 
And in fact, the next game, we're going to show you how Black won a game. One of the top players, uh, 2,700 player, uh, played Black in this position. Okay, so now we have, I love scavenging in positions. Problem is to how to achieve such positions. There are plenty of options, con time and off and apart from E6, there is the Nidorf way. I would say the Nidorf way is the most common way to try to get a scavenging in these days. Only because, supposedly, people are afraid of the carry's attack, although I, I don't know if people really really believe that. The traditional scavenging, and this is the order, it's playing this right away. And that's called the scavenging structure, everybody. That's a standard Sicilian structure, as opposed to the structure where black plays for e5 and gets this structure. That's, those are the two basic uh, Sicilian structures in the center that are the most common ones. And um, I, if you, the, the reason that people traditionally didn't like this move was, was this move, which had tremendous success over the years. That's called the carries attack. But I think as the years have gone on, black has gotten more satisfied with the black side of this, mainly because of the defense h6. That, that defense has been the most common. It used to be that black would play very dynamically here and just lure white forward and then sort of counterattack on the queen side. And I think as the years went on, at least this was uncomfortable for black. It may not be bad, but it, it got a really nice winning percentage for white. But my impression is that if you look at a scavenging book, they'll suggest that this is okay for black. They usually put that as part of their repertoire. So I would not be afraid of playing this order, but I would look up how to play against the carry's attack. If he doesn't play the carry's attack, you're just going to play what you always play in this scavenging. You can you know, you play like this, you can play like this, but your knight here which is really what distinguishes it. If you play knight c6, you're back in a classical. I mean, just for example, this would be a sort of a classical position with the knight on c6. Or even, even this is actually transposes to a classical kind of position, Richter Rouserish kind of thing. Um, but what distinguishes this heaven again is putting the knight on d7, as often you do in the, in the Paulson, for example. But um, but, but what's discouraged black over the years from playing this order has been this move, and I don't think it does anymore discourage him that much. One of my friends plays Skahevening, and he's not worried about that at all. So, so the other way to play, and you mentioned the carry's attack, the other way to play is to play a Nidorf. I see, and you don't want to play against bishop g5. Now his point is, is that this way you can get a scaven, and if you know white plays some normal move like that, or bishop e2, you can go back into that pawn structure, that scavenging and pawn structure, and this is a move you're going to make anyway in the scavenging, and almost always. So you can transpose without allowing that g4 move I just showed you. But of course you allow all the other Nidorf problems. You allow bishop c4, you allow bishop g5, which is the one that he's mentioning right now. And uh, he says it's annoying. Well, you know, it's a point. I mean, you have to learn bishop g5 is black if you're going to play the knight or So that's just kind of what you have to live with. And if you don't like that, I would suggest just go back. I, I think it's a lot easier to just not worry about the carry's attack. Unless, unless you've gone over this in tremendous detail over the years and you really hate playing against it. And then in that case, maybe I would switch to the knight or and simply play, um, just learn the bishop g5 lines. Because after all, the Nidorf is played by almost every player in the world, it seems like, all the, you know, all the top players in the world, and they don't think bishop g5 wins. So you, know, you just have to study it and learn, uh, learn how to play against it. I think it's a lot easier to play uh, e6 first and just play against g4 than it is to learn all this theory. There's a lot of theory after bishop g5. OK, great question. Super question. So let me go on and talk about, um, keep the questions coming, folks. Let me go on and talk about the queen a4 one more time, because we probably won't come back to this in future weeks. So I want to show one other example of this Grunfeld. And maybe this one's a little friend, more friendlier from Black's point of view. Um, OK, so this is what we're talking about. This is the main line of the Grunfeld, and it's easy to get to for white. So at least white, and, and Black has to allow it. So. So it's relevant from both sides. OK, check. Now we just looked at queen d7. Let's look at knight d7. Knight d7 is a, a more dynamic move and keeps the pieces on. One problem with queen d7, of course, is there's also just you have to try and win this endgame as black. That's not so easy. And it turns out it's not easy for white either. So, so um, that's why we looked at this move queen here. But um, at least you've avoided that problem when you play knight d7. And of course there's bishop d7 too, but I'm not going to go into a lot. I'm not going to give a complete survey of queen a4 check. That would be impossible. 
But let me show you this game. Um, white just develops, black develops, white gets his pieces out, and he plays. That's a very common way to play if you play queen a4 is get this out quickly and get this rook to either this square, protecting c3, or this square, discouraging c5. That's a typical setup. And let me show you how black responds to that setup. You play c5, that's pretty much what you always do in these positions. And one idea for white now is to play the move d5, but you can't play d5 right away because of bishop takes check. So this move rook c1 is a pre preparatory move for the move d5. And also, if black ever takes there, which he usually wants to do, look, you've opened up the c-file. So this move rook c1 is quite useful. Um, black plays h6, white retreats. I'm not saying these are the best moves theoretically, although they've been played quite a few times. And black shores up that square, the c5 square, and prepares bishop b7. So black's plan might be the usual idea of playing bishop b7, rook c8, maybe capturing on c5, maybe playing a6 and b5 later. Those are kind of the typical ideas. And this, these moves have all been played a bunch. Now, I this is a very interesting point where you can try bishop b5, which I mentioned in my book, by, by the way, my book is Strategic Chess Opening Repertoire for White. And one idea there is if black plays this move, and you, the idea is that bishop b7 can't be played anymore because you're winning a piece. Um, a6 is kind of interesting just because after you win the piece you get this. I mean, it's, it's complicated. After a6 it looks terrible, but that moves possible, maybe. Actually, I think you move the rook first. But a6 is conceivable. But, but the other point is that um, bishop b7 is stopped because that square is hanging. So if, not, if the knight comes there, it looks like, well, at least I've gained a tempo. But black, white can play aggressively here. Um, play, for example, this move and then shore up the center with f3, and the idea is that that can happen. Whoops, sorry, the, the pawn isn't necessarily hanging because of this move. Now, that's not the end of it. This position turns out to be kind of complicated, believe it or not, because there's strange things to do involving these kinds of moves. But, um, but that's a way that white can, that's an alternative white can try instead of the fairly slow move, bishop e2. Okay, so black plays there anyway, attacking the square. And again, you can think about playing here because if black takes, you can go here, and black's a little tied down there. It's complicated because there's a knight c6 move coming. It's a mess. But uh, once again, there's knight c3 ideas, so it's a, it's a mess. But that's a way that white can avoid getting too passive. In the game, he does end up getting pretty passive. He takes that, which is okay move, and then black attacks this square. And white simply can't afford that kind of pawn structure. Like if white made a, a move what would be a move here? I mean, he could, for example, um, try to take this. And what he runs into is this horrible pawn structure. So even white, even though white's had materially, what happens here is that black's got a much, much better game because these are so weak. And black's simply going to take back here. He's going to have an open file. And you have to take my word for that, but that's disaster. So white has to move that bishop. And in the game, white plays the bishop back. But I think he should play the bishop here covering that square, and I think this position white can still try to play for an advantage. It's certainly not going to be much, but it's a playable game for both sides. It's a very interesting game for both sides. I'd rather be white here, actually. Just, if nothing else, because this knight's sort of stuck out there, and it, it's, it, there's a threat to even try to maybe win a piece, because the knight has no retreat squares. Now, of course, it's not that easy. Black can just play here and attack the queen. There's plenty of ways to save the knight, but I just, I think this is the way to play, because what white does, instead of that, is he goes backwards, here, and pretty soon black actually gets an advantage. White kicks the knight around a little, but this can be even a slightly weak pawn. So white tries the best thing he can do here, which is try to win a, well he should, he should probably try to win a pawn for his trouble, because black's starting to become positionally better here. Look how passive those guys are. White plays there instead, aiming at that square. And black threatens to exchange queens, and now we're seeing what the Grunfeld ideas are. If you look at this position, Black's actually very happy here. He has ways to get in on the queen side. These bishops are passive. White has no king side attack at all, and that pawn can even be a little weak. It sort of ties that knight down from moving. So here's what white wants in the Grunfeld to a large extent, what black wants, excuse me. So white avoids that, but he's still in trouble because the queen, the queen really, what's it doing on that square? Unless white can attack the king side, which he really can't do here, black's going to be just better by attacking on the queen side. He's also got this beautiful move, queen up, followed by, for example, bishop a6 and win all the white squares. And here's what happens. White tries to attack, but there's no real attack over here. Black just stops it. 
white moves, black plays here, and now that pawn's hanging. Things are really going downhill. Um, I'll just show you a few more moves. There's a nice move here. Knight c3, of course, attacks both these squares. White moves over. And black sacrifices the exchange, but it's not much of a sacrifice, because after that move, he's attacking white's rook. White moves back. And now white can't even castle because that knight is pinned and attacked twice. And black's threatening knight c3 again. I think I'll just stop here. Black's considerably better here. Um, and uh, and went on to win. It wasn't totally straightforward, but it, but he went on to win this game. So I think that's a nice game. That's a good a good uh, game to show the black how, what black's chances look like too. Aha! Some 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 chat stuff here. This will be fun. So let's uh, let's go back here in prepare preparation. Okay, what are some good gambit openings? That's a very broad question. Uh, we I think we talked about this last week. Some of the good gambits. There's, there's plenty of good gambits. Most of the best gambits are for white, of course, because he's not a tempo behind. But there are even some that are good for black. Uh, and we could talk about that, except that, of course, there's thousands of gambits. <laughs> it's a little hard to get too specific. But we, I can think about that for a second. Let's see if we've got some other questions. So first, do you play the hedgehog? I have in the past, but not very much. I was an English opening player as white, so I played the white side of the hedgehog. Let's just look at what the hedgehog is. Now, many things are called the hedgehog. The hedgehog, in a way, is just a pawn structure. But um, the sort of more famous, most famous kind of instantiation of the hedge, what was originally called the hedgehog, was a, a, a sort of a um, English opening, a symmetrical English opening structure, which went like this, or maybe Viking Castle first, of course. And uh, the idea is it's this pawn structure. Now, there's various orders by which you can get these structures, but just so you know, and the idea is black's probably going to play, to make a true hedgehog, he's also going to play a6, which, by the way, stops knight b5 ideas. Um, so it's like a Sicilian defense in that white's given up his d-pawn for the c-pawn, but a little unlike it because white hasn't moved his e-pawn yet, and he's played c4. But, uh, and that's what some, sometimes when you play the Sicilian defense, white, black sets up with this pawn structure, and they call it a hedgehog pawn structure, even though, officially speaking, this is the hedgehog. It's an English opening. And... Um, Black's idea is that he's got a, a central majority, just like in the, in the Sicilian defense, a two-to-one majority, which is a true advantage. In fact, it's about his only advantage because he doesn't have very much space and he doesn't have any development. So <laughs> his biggest advantage is the Sicilian advantage, which is the central pawn majority. It's a fun opening, and I would definitely say you can play it for either side. It's a little bit sophisticated. My feeling is that when you're starting out, it's probably not worth playing on either side, really, but especially as black. Because you lack space, and it takes a lot of very, very sophisticated positional judgments. So I wouldn't be too thrilled about playing this as black. It's got a cool name, Hedgehog, but except for that, I'm not, not real thrilled with it. On the other hand, it's completely sound. Plenty of world championships champions have played it. Not many of them are playing it these days. What they, what they play more often against the English, if they're going to play with b6, is they play, let me go back, they play maybe b6 here. And they play double fianchetto. That's considered a safer way to play uh, these kinds of positions. And the same thing can happen. This kind of thing can happen. These kinds of moves can happen. That, that's more common. And often black doesn't win a tempo on the queen, but instead plays the uh, d6. Whose move is it? OK, white's move. Let's just make a move maybe here. b3 is played. Often black will put the knight there, actually, and just leave the queen there, since it's going to have to move again anyway. And maybe later he'll play that and play a hedgehog structure, but you'll notice the d-pawn isn't protected anymore, so he's got to be very careful about doing that. He has to prepare that. So what was the question? Do you play it? Well, I have played it in the past, but not much, and it's uh, a long time ago. Who do you think is going to win the World Championship, Karyakin? We've talked about this all right. Trump. <laughs> yes, there you go. Will Karyakin or Trump win? Uh, we'll find out about Trump. Today is Election Day in the United States. We'll find out soon whether he's uh, going to win the presidency anyway. And once he wins the presidency, he can use the military to enforce the works. chess world championship, I'm sure. He can threaten all the countries of the world with a nuclear attack if they don't give him the world chess championship. So I wouldn't put it past him necessarily. Um, but we'll see if he wins the presidency first. Uh, Karyakin, I'm kind of, in many ways, I'm sort of almost rooting for Karyakin. At least to, everybody wants to, a good match. So let's hope he does better than probably expected. Um, one thing I was thinking about Karyakin recently was this choice of uh, seconds with Mamad Yarov and the uh, where he could do something funny. I think what everybody expects 
is for why for both sides to play very slowly and carefully, especially at the beginning of the match. And I was thinking about, you know, Carlson has started slowly in a lot of tournaments. I mean, obviously Carlson's maybe the great, certainly the highest rated player in history. Yeah, he doesn't lose many games, so it's so for him to say start slowly does, maybe doesn't. It's just a relative term, but it seems to me maybe you should go for it early on. Play if Karyakin's going to play actively, he should do so right from the start. My guess is they'll be cautious and play it professionally. And professionally means play very slowly and say, try to beat me. Both, both sides will play that way. Neither side will try, take too many chances. But I think if anybody should take a chance, it would be really fun. It would, it would really surprise everyone if Karyakin came out. He certainly knows how to attack. He's a great player. He's played for years. If he played a little more aggressively at the beginning and tried to maybe get Carlson while he's still a little off balance. Carlson to some extent has indicated that he, he, he prefers to warm up a little and maybe doesn't play quite as well at the very beginning of an event. So what the heck, maybe, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's worth trying to do. Um, okay, what openings would you play if you were Carlson with Karakin that would give him the best winning chances that fit his style? I don't think Carlson has to worry about the openings as much as Karyakin does because Carlson can play any opening. Most of the openings that Carlson plays, Carlson could, you might easily see him play something like just knight, knight f3 and c4 or something, or, or, or a d4 line, but not a nice slow one. He might even play something like a London or a Tory or something. Carlson's just going to prepare something that he hasn't played before, very much at least, so that Karyakin can't be totally prepared. I don't think he's going to play huge main lines. He might play right into a main line opening, you know, a Grunfeld or something, or a whatever, Queen's Gambit declined, but he'll play a slightly offbeat line that gives white a, a small advantage if black doesn't play perfectly, and if, if it gives an equal game, that's okay, as long as he knows kind of how to play for little tiny advantages. That's what Carlson does against just about everybody. Uh, as black, I think he'll come up with something different. You know, Remember against Anand, he played the Grunfeld, uh, which he hadn't played much before, and that was, I think, to avoid preparation. So I think Karyak, uh, uh, Carlson will tend to play something Solid. There's plenty of deep pawn openings that you can play. Um, you know, you can play Queen's Gambit. You can play uh, Nimzo Indianish, Nimzo Queen's Indian kind of things. You can play the Grunfeld. You can play. You could even play a Dutch if you're careful with it. If you play it in a safe way, I, I don't expect that. But you can you can play that kind of thing. There's a variety of different kinds of Queen's Gambits you can play. Um, I expect Carl. I expect Carl Jochen to play D4 just because E4 is so easy to prepare against, and and he hasn't had much luck against Carlson with E4 in the past. Uh, Karyakin is switching very slowly to d4. He's splitting now between e4 and d4. Presumably he'll play both, but there's only 12 games, so we'll see. Um, I have a horrible feeling that both sides are going to just play very slowly in the opening, and the openings are not going to be all that important. Both, both sides are going to try and squeeze some tiny advantage and then just play it out. What's really important is can Carlson make Karyakin feel uncomfortable enough, even in a technical opening, that Karyakin uses a lot of time in his clock. Because Karyakin, if he has enough time, in a, even in a position where he stands a little worse, can probably, he, play, he just plays so well. He's a great player. He can draw a guy like Carlson if there isn't much of an advantage and if it's a technical position. But if he's short on time, I think that's where you'll find that it's going to be a lot of pressure on Karyakin to play against Carlson. So as long as Karyakin handles the clock well, you know, it should be, it should be very interesting. So I wish I could give you more specifics about the opening, but you know Carlson plays everything, so I don't think um, I don't think it's possible to predict what he's going to play. He's going to play. He could play e4, d4, c4, knight f3. It wouldn't much matter as long as he plays it um, with his usual very conservative style. Uh, Hedgehog is a pawn formation in chess adopted by Black that can arrive from. Yes, that's one way to look at it. And I did mention that you can get a hedgehog in. Uh, in the Sicilian, for example, your scheveling can turn into sort of a hedgehog position, can't it? Um, you know, this, this kind of thing. This can be considered a hedgehog position if black plays b6 soon. Let's say white plays slowly. Maybe black would move against this, for example. Whoops, whose move is it? Sorry, black's move. Um, if white plays some sort of uh, b a4 kind of thing, there's a hedgehog structure. So you can call that the hedgehog structure, but the hedgehog opening, more or less officially, is not a Sicilian defense. It's, a, it's an English opening. It's a C4, C5 English opening. So there's two ways to look at it. There's the hedgehog opening itself, and I think you can say, you know, properly, <laughs> I don't know, I don't want to be too technical, 
no one, most people would not call this a hedgehog for black. They might call it a hedgehog structure, but they wouldn't call it a hedgehog, this position in front of you. Whereas, whereas this, these lines where, well, we'll show it to you again, uh, these lines where black plays with b6 and white plays b3 and white plays, you know, this sort of stuff. Um, this is, officially speaking, a hedgehog variation of the English opening. That's, so it's a, maybe a technical point. Um, uh, so the Sicilian defense version is not really a hedgehog. There's no such thing as a hedgehog variation in the Sicilian, but there are many hedgehog structures in the Sicilian. So that's one way to look at it. Okay. Uh, that's surprising. Absolutely, yeah. I don't know why nobody wants to vote for me. I don't, why don't they listen to me? That's my question. They should listen to me. I tell everybody this, and somehow I don't get a response. The TCEC computer match between Stockfish and Houdini will start at the same time. So I didn't know that. Interesting. Um, there are some experts. I have some friends who really follow the computer chess championships. They are pretty fascinating. I think, you know, there's a point where we're just going to see 100 straight draws and then finally a win or something in these computer championships, I'm afraid. Um, but not yet. They're still interesting. Uh, and I wish I had strong opinions about them, but I just don't follow them. But it's interesting to say that. Is Houdini 5 out yet? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think I just saw that it was. Well, I better not say that, because I'm not sure. I don't use Houdini these days, so I'm not sure. Um, no, I guess I'll wait until after the match. We're talking about Trump or oh, Watson. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know who you, who's, who's going to wait. Wait to run for president or wait to put Houdini 5 out? Uh, Stockfish 8 came out a few days ago. Okay. What's it? You guys can talk with each other about computers, uh, engines, because I use them, but I don't, I don't really keep track of them. I'm using Komodo a lot recently. What's the difference between the English defense and the Queen's Indian? Um, uh, well, I'll show you. Good question. Uh, the English defense, properly speaking, starts out with these moves, and then after white plays here, black plays this. That's the English defense, that position. Uh, and it could theoretically still become a Queen's Indian if black wanted to, just for example, if white played there and black played here, we'd already have a que Queen's Indian. But the idea of the English defense is usually not to play a Queen's Indian, it's to play this move, not to put the knight on f6. So for example, before, instead of putting the knight on c6, you're going to put your bishop on b4, and maybe your pawn on f5. Very common way to play. Maybe you're not on e7 sometimes. Sometimes black just puts the knight on e7. In a queen's Indian, the black knight is always on f6. For example, that would be a queen's Indian again. The queen's Indian move order is usually to play, um, excuse me, to play d4 first, although c4 can happen too, and then play this move. This is officially the queen's Indian move order. And if white plays knight c3, black won't usually play b6 because that allows e4. So the queen's Indian comes up after knight f3, which allows you to play b6 because there's no e4 move. And if you play knight c3 now, there's still no e4 move. And if white plays queen c2, if nothing else you could play here, and there's still no e4 move. So, so the queen's Indian has to do with the move knight f6 in conjunction with b6 against d4 openings. And the English defense has to do with the moves e6 and b6, uh, either just against this setup, for example, this is an English defense structure, this kind of thing. And white doesn't have to play d4. White can play bishop d3. White can play e3. White can play g3. Uh, but if white does play d4, black doesn't play knight f6. Black plays bishop b4 and tries to attack the center this way. And then in this position, he actually plays f5. So there's no knight f6. In, in the English defense, you, you wait. You wait with knight f6 so that you can attack the center in other ways. Okay. Um, can you look over Rapport's win over Aronian as an interesting opening? You would have to show me that opening. Just put the moves on the uh, chat if you can. The first moves so we can take a look at it. I um, I don't I, I don't have the ability right now to zoom off, get get that game, and pop it on to ICC without wasting your time. I'd have to use, you know, I'd have to do an extra three or four minutes just to do that. I'm not sure if I understand the difference. The difference is let me try it again. The difference is that in the Queen's Indian you play move knight f6. So it's really very different. Let me just show you one more time. Um, black doesn't have the moves. This is the Queen's Indian. And you know I can make a few more moves, but um, for example, that's the main line, one of the main lines. And then black plays either here or here. 
Um, but but there's no f5 move, for example, and there's no knight e7 move. Black, black, white isn't attacking with the move f5. That's one way to look at it. The black isn't. Black's just getting his pieces out and playing nice and calmly. And maybe he's going to play knight e4 at some point. That's one of the big moves that black often makes. For example, after um, after castles and knight c3 and knight e4, that kind of thing. So that's the queen's the the queen's Indian. He's not playing for f5. He's playing playing for more maybe peace play. And the English defense. One more time. Let me show you. Officially, the English defense happens after c4 first. But if it transposes into a d4 opening, it's not knight f6. It's b6. And then, for example, um, something else besides uh, besides knight f6. For example, this move. Notice how different this is from a queen's Indian. White's already got the move e4 in, for example. If white defends that center, black will play, well, there's many moves. One idea is to gambit a pawn here. But the point is he doesn't play knight f6. And in fact, knight f6 would be a pretty mediocre move here because now there's no way to attack this center. You're also asking for that move, of course. But <clears throat> it's not. you don't have a break with f5. So another way to play these positions is to play knight here and then follow it up with the move f5. See, that's the English defense. It's basically these kind of moves without knight f6. Because you're planning to put your knight somewhere else. Sometimes the knight goes to h6, by the way. It just doesn't go to f6. So there's really quite a huge difference the minute you get into the middle game. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. I see. I, but this makes it maybe even more clear, hopefully, with any luck. And um, All right. Let's keep moving here. Let me see. Yes, I showed Milman Fang. Yes, hey, you missed. I have two. I, I gave two answers to two of your questions. We showed the Halloween Gambit. You're late, I guess. We showed Milman Fang, and uh, and we showed um, the Halloween Gambit. I got to I got to say real quick what I said. Poor Thilo Twenty Eight Fool. It was such a good, great question. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, he asked about this. Uh, I'm not going to do this again because you can go back and look at YouTube uh, after the show and look at it. So I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But we looked at. Uh, your question from last week, I just mentioned that I showed quite a few lines with this, but I mentioned that I think this line is a mega problem for white. I think I think this move is just really, really a problem. I actually looked this up on correspondence because this is something I remember from a long time ago and I thought I'd look up and then this and I showed a game with this. So you can go back and look at that. And that's that's to me almost a refutation. I, I could be wrong though, because I don't know it well enough and I noticed that people with the Halloween Gambit are always saying no that's you know they find new lines and new ways to keep the opening alive but I think they're going to have a heck of a time to um, a heck of a time oh look at these questions uh, re playing against this so I think the Helen Gambit is marginal it might be unsound I, you have to prove it to me to show me that it's sound okay um, and we did show Norman Fang although I didn't really annotate in any detail okay Rapper played the Jigorin. Yes, a lot of good players have played the Jigorin. Smizlov played the Jigorin. Uh, all kinds of players have played the Jigorin. It doesn't have to start with C4. It transposes right. Yeah, it can... Uh, oh, he played the Jigorin today. Oh, we should see it. We want to see it. Oh, show me the moves. Yes. Oh, let's go. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Jonathan Russell, I'm really loving this because I wrote a book about the Jigorins years ago and I helped... The best book about the Jigorin by Brodigan, I helped... Um, I helped him, a bronze neck, excuse me, I helped him uh, with some materials, so we talked about it a lot. I always follow theory in the Chigorans. Um, knight of six, C, D, knight, D. Um, this isn't even the main line. Knight of three, E5, that's the, that's the normal move. And uh, D5, bishop, B4, okay, that's interesting. The, the move that I recommend in my book, and most people recommend, is knight takes C3 immediately. And I've looked at this many, many times over the years, and I think black is okay here, but he decides to play it this way, which I think has been played before, but it wasn't my, it wasn't my recommended game. Terrific, yeah, this is, this is great. I love it when people do things like this. The Jigorin is still a playable opening, I think. You know, Morozevich played it for several years against the best players of the world, so they knew they were going to play it. He played against Kramnik, Anand, in a whole series of consecutive tournaments, so they all had a chance to prepare for it. So anybody who thinks that the Jigorin is completely unsound, has to explain why Anon, Leko, Shiroff, Kramnik, all these people could could prepare for it over the course of several months and not be able to beat Morozevich. Which they weren't, by the way. They didn't win the but Morozevich did fine with it. 
So um, yeah, the Chagorin is worth uh, pick, picking up. I think you'll, you'll find, have a great time with it. Okay, what a sacrifice. Well, it'd be nice if I could see, yeah, what the sacrifice was. So I'll look at, I'll obviously look at this game later. We can even look at it next week, maybe. That's a thought. And um, Rook H8 check. Oh, I'm getting all, oh, someone put the game up. I put the game up. You could, you could just keep putting moves up. Um, your favorite living player is uh, Rapport? Or Morozavich? No, Rapport, probably. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I've got a treat coming then, uh, along with the election. I've got a treat coming up. And guess what? It's uh, 10 minutes past the hour in this supposedly hour-long show, so I think we'll just uh, wrap it up there. Everybody go look for at the U.S. elections, and you've now got a tip about playing this uh, this uh, game in the Chagorin defense, which of course I'm in love with. Um, so we'll, uh, I, I would suggest everybody go out and take a look at that. Thanks everybody for coming on. I had a good time, and I'll see you next week.